into the larger framework, I think we're all trying to work through these early stage questions about what is energy democracy. So taking stock of the, um, the uh, extant research and taking stock of some of the theoretical tools that are out there is a good thing to do. So we hope to make some contribution to that by way of this panel. So here's what I want to talk about. Um, I have two main arguments that I'd like to make this morning. So one of them is I'd like to say that um, as a piece of what we're talking about at this two-day symposium, I would encourage us to pay some particular attention to these organizations and institutions that society has created uh, that are in the business of regulating energy-related activities. And this regulatory work really has two parts. And some agencies are more focused on one, others on the other. One part is what I would call uh, efforts to produce abundance. So we heard yesterday from Heal Utah and the Utah Energy uh, Coalition. We heard them talking about the work that they're doing, trying to promote rooftop solar and other alternative energy technologies. Much of that has to be channeled through regulatory organizations. The goal there is to uh, presumably produce more abundance. Of course, we, we know that the story is more complicated than that. Other regulatory institutions are more involved in managing or controlling risks. We heard a lot about that last night from Allison McFarland talking about the work of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So I'm going to suggest that as part of what we would do in a program of research on energy democracy, we would want to be uh, paying some attention to what goes on with these regulatory organizations and institutions. Similarly, I would like to suggest that we want to pay particular attention not just to the work of trying to promote, produce, and equitably distribute abundant energy, but the sort of parallel problem of managing the risks that go with energy production. So this is all in the context, as we all know and have alluded to yesterday, uh, in the context of a kind of harshly, increasingly harshly anti-regulatory climate. And uh, we need to be considering how that factors in as well. So I'll talk a little bit today about two theoretical frameworks that we might use to think through some of the associated questions, one from Ulrich Beck, one from Niklas Luhmann. Some of you are familiar with these theorists, others here probably are not. So I'm trying to kind of hit that sweet spot of not saying too much about these theorists, but, but just pulling out some key ideas. And I want to bring that toward a, a concept that I'm calling energy governance, which is a larger concept than, or maybe not larger, but different, slightly different and associated concept um, relative to energy democracy. So I'm thinking of governance as the large process by which we grapple with these issues. And democracy, the way I think about it, a principle that we aspire to as we do the work of governance. So let's talk a little bit about the roles that regulatory institutions play in that, in that context. Uh, the relationship between energy governance and energy democracy, and I'll just hit on a few illustrative examples as we go ahead with this. So uh, just quickly I'll mention that the, what I'm talking about today is informed by um, a number of uh, research projects that I've been involved in over the years. I spent time um, with the Hanford, on the Hanford Advisory Board, which, governs the, which provides advice <clears throat> to three agencies regarding the nuclear waste cleanup issues at the Hanford Nuclear Reservation in the state of Washington. The um, board provides advice to the Department of Energy, which is not a regulatory institution, but also to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, which is a regulatory institution, and to the Washington Department of Ecology, which is the state's version of EPA. Uh, when I moved to North Carolina, I became aware that there is a regulatory institution called the North Carolina Utilities Commission. I've been following their work since I moved there in 2004, but I've been more closely engaged since 2011. Uh, there is a watchdog group um, which does work similar to the work that we heard about from, um, uh, from uh, Josh and Michael yesterday. 
Uh, it's called North Carolina Waste Awareness and Reduction Network. I've been watching the work that they do. And since about 2012, I've been tracking more closely the work of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, which we heard about from uh, Allison last night. Um, I did a Fulbright in Germany. I've made three trips to Japan, so there's some international perspective that I try to bring to this. I've worked with a program at NC State on genetic engineering and society, and I've developed a course called Governing Risky Technologies. So that's where my thinking comes from, um, as well as from the theoretical work that I make use of. So quick um, gloss of the work of Ulrich Beck. Uh, I always like to mention that um, when Beck died on January 1st of 2015, <coughs> sociologist Anthony Giddens um, wrote an obituary in which he said that Beck was the greatest sociologist of his generation. I find that interesting because if you asked me who was the greatest sociologist of this generation, I probably would say Anthony Giddens. Uh, so Giddens has some cred, uh, but he's deferring to Beck. So Beck's work is important largely because it's a kind of grand theory of society. And I'll give you a, a quick gloss on that in a moment. Um, interestingly, uh, the book that made him famous, Risk Society, was published in German almost immediately after the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, and that was part of what got his work on the public agenda was translated into English a few years later. Um, he also was a member of the German Ethics Commission on a Safe Energy Supply, which Angela Merkel established immediately after the uh, meltdowns at Fukushima. I like the idea that, what did they call it? They called it an ethics commission. I don't think that would happen in the US. We'd call it a blue ribbon commission, whatever that means. Uh, but they were zeroing in on the notion of ethics, and I think that's an important difference between how they think about these things in Europe and how we think about them here in the US. And in the last couple of years of his life, Beck wrote about what he called the concept of an emancipatory catastrophe. He was writing about climate change, and he was suggesting that, of course, it's a terrible thing, uh, but perhaps it's the kind of catastrophe that we need to jolt us into a more radical change of how we do business. So that's a promising idea. It's too bad it got cut short when he died in 2015. Okay, basic ideas of risk society. First of all, Beck says that traditionally society evolved in order to manage the problem of scarcity. We had scarce resources. How do we distribute them equitably and justly? So the democratic distribution of scarce resources was the key social problem. He says that as we moved into the modern age, uh, a second level of issues emerged. Some people mistakenly think that Beck claims that risk issues have replaced scarcity issues. Well, I don't think he's saying that. He's saying we have another layer of issues that we have to deal with involving the very same risks that we produce as we try to address the problem of scarcity. So generating energy produces environmental and public health hazards, and now we have to develop institutions and frameworks and the legal uh, apparatus to deal with those. So we have a long history of developing institutions and activities for managing scarcity. We have a much shorter history, a couple hundred years maybe, of developing institutions for managing risks. My spouse works in the insurance business, and that's been cited as one of the early institutions that um, came about in order to deal with risks, financial risks primarily, or indemnity risks um, of various kinds. Without insurance, we could not have the society that we have today. Uh, institutions like the Environmental Protection Agency legal apparatus like uh, National Environmental Protection Act and the NEPA process, which we use to do public comment and, um, and uh, engagement around environmental issues. These are all risk management frameworks. So one thing I'd suggest we talk about at our, at our symposium and beyond is um, if we're grappling with issues of risk, are they somehow fundamentally different? Do we need to think about them in a different way? then we think about issues of addressing scarcity. So here are a few rather obvious examples of those differences. So in the scarcity society, your goal is to enhance production of whatever. Um, in a risk society, it's to reduce the production of risks. In a scarcity society, we want to amplify or increase social goods, whatever we deem them to be. 
In a risk society, we seek to attenuate social bads. In a scarcity society, it's about distribution. In a risk society, it's about minimization or containment. In a scarcity society, it's about achieving the things we desire. In a risk society, it's about distancing ourselves from things that we don't want. In a scarcity society, it's about re rewarding people for contributing to productivity. In a risk society, I'm not sure compensation is the whole story, but one thing we find ourselves doing is looking for ways to compensate communities, such as the, Allison mentioned, the Swedish, uh, the, the Finnish communities that have um, been interested in hosting a nuclear waste site. Um, also in the United States, questions of nuclear waste storage uh, often involve efforts to compensate societies for participating in that process and considering the possibility of being hosts for nasty materials. Those are just a few differences. We can all think of many more. A uh, quick gloss of this other theorist that I want to mention today, Nicholas Luhmann. He's a little more complex and abstract. Um, look at the first word on the slide, for example. Uh, he talks about autopoetic or self-organizing systems. They kind of run on autopilot, right? Um, in that sense, they're not reflexive. So one of the issues that we'll get to in talking about Lumen is how can we do this organizational work of producing the society that we have in a more reflective way, in a more thoughtful way, right? Autopoetic systems in Lumen's model are also based on these binary communication co codes. So we have an economic subsystem that is concerned only with what's profitable and what is not profitable. Decisions are made, presumably, for Lumen, exclusively on that basis. We have a political system which is about power, right? This could be power over, which is the, the kind of alt-right understanding that Jen Schneider talked about yesterday, or it could be power with. I think we tend to talk about it more as a power over issue when we think of politics, but maybe we need to think that through a little bit differently. Um, in the legal system, it's about what's legal or not legal. Well, that's kind of a chicken and egg question because what's legal or not legal is simply what we define as such, right? In the scientific system, it's about truth, right? And the scientific method is supposedly producing accurate, verifiable truth. Lumen's notion is that each of these systems kind of runs on its own and it doesn't engage with the other systems unless it's forced to. Most of the time it regards them as the external environment to which it must respond. It's not actively engaging. Engagement for Lumen is represented by this notion of resonance. So there is a certain, certain amount of resonance across these systems. But there can be too little, there can be too much, and I'll talk about an example in a moment. One final idea from Lumen, he has a kind of metacode, and his metacode is the question of inclusion. Who's included in each of these systems, economic, political, legal, science? In the legal framework, for example, we have the question of standing. Do I have legal standing to come to court or come to the regulatory body? and make my case. Some people have that standing, others do not, right? So the metacode of inclusion is an important piece of this <clears throat> as well. Um, here's an example. So what happened at Fukushima? The seismology knowledge was there, uh, that there could have been an earthquake of the size that occurred and the attendant tsunami. Um, the, science, the science people knew that. The political system did not pay enough attention to that. So we had too little resonance across those systems. Uh, the political system, on the other hand, was strongly driven by economic motives of profitability. So in that regard, we had too much resonance. So this can go on you know, simultaneously, too much and too little. Um, in terms of center and periphery, there were 10 nuclear power react 10 nuclear reactors at the Fukushima plants Daini and Daiichi. Six at Daiichi, four at Daini, um, not very far from each other. This was a peripheral location, a low wealth, low income, low political power location in China, uh, in, in Japan. A Japanese author, Hasegawa, has done a really cool kind of mapping of the postal codes in Japan because Tokyo is the lowest number postal code, and as you go to the peripheral areas of Japan, the numbers in the postal code get higher. 
that's where the reactors are, right? So very, <laughs> you can, the citation is there if you want to follow up on this. So we look for uh, the map of reactors and lo and behold, it's superimposed upon the low wealth, low income, low power communities in Japan. So, all right, um, taking some of these theoretical ideas and trying to put them to work, well, let me talk about this notion of democratic risk governance. So energy democracy, energy governance, um, related principles, but we want to work through how they're in discuss, uh, debate, in what ways they're related. So risk governance then is some larger process. It involves all sorts of public discourse in any and all venues. Uh, media and journalism play a particular role. There's a larger, broader, and rather hard to define and multifaceted cultural context for all of this. So now we see the rise of the alt-right, for example, referring to, to Jen's talk yesterday. Um, what does that add? We, we see the general polarization of the political climate. Um, this is part, this plays into the, it, the, the enables and constrains the processes of risk governance. Certain opportunities arise, certain challenges arise as well. Um, political institutions and legal frameworks all have to operate in a way that resonates with sufficiently and not too sufficiently, not excessively, um, with this changing uh, cultural and political context. So within that framework, regulatory institutions typically do three kinds of work. They make the rules. We know a lot about that. They enforce the rules. We know about that. But a somewhat overlooked aspect of the work that regulatory institutions do is they do the necessary research in order to inform and support the rulemaking process. So a great example or a sad example of this is what's been happening to EPA's climate science, right? They have a very robust, they have had a very robust program of climate science. Um, it's, I was gonna say it's being hacked away at, but that's too weak a metaphor, right? It's being dismantled even as we speak. Um, so that's a point of attack on regulatory institutions where they're especially sensitive because when their budgets get cut, um, it's often research will be the first thing to go, right? As well as the political dynamic that's at play as well, right? So current threats and challenges to regulatory institutions include the prevailing anti-regulatory political and rhetorical environment, uh, a couple of Jen and Jennifer, uh, Jen, Jen and Jenny uh, yesterday both made reference to this emerging talk of risk of energy dominance. I had noticed that myself and I'm glad other people did too because it's only just emerging, right? But what does this idea of energy dominance mean and how would it change the context in which regulatory institutions operate? And another emerging uh, talking point um, in that community is this idea of cooperative federalism. So there's a white paper, Rick Perry is a fan of this. Uh, need I say more? Uh, <laughs> that's his picture, in case you're interested. Uh, cooperative federalism is the idea that we push down the regulatory activities to the state level. So this came from a white paper produced by a council of state agencies. So um, I, I haven't looked at it in enough detail yet, it's pretty new. Um, to understand why they would be promoting this idea because it seems to me it puts a lot of burdens on them. But it's been picked up and they're running with it at the federal level now as a way of pushing down or, or distancing themselves from regulatory commitments, right? So uh, these, these issues are now playing out in a lot of contexts. So four quick examples. Stephanie tells me four minutes, four examples. Perfect. So um, four current examples. Um, Alison McFarland talked about one of these uh, at length last night, right? What do we do with news, use nuclear fuel? Um, there are not just issues of selecting a final disposal site, but there are issues of where might we put the stuff in the meantime if those spent fuel pools and on-site um, above ground storage, if we're running out of space, and we are, what do we do with that stuff? Well, there might be a lot of transportation. Here's a map produced by the Nevada, Nevada um, Nuclear Projects Agency, who are strong opponents of the Yucca Mountain Project. It's the Salt Lake City map. These are the routes that nuclear waste would follow on its way from its sources 
to the Yucca Mountain site. You can go to their website and find maps for every major city in the United States. Here's a place where regulatory uh, decision making um, gets informed by the input that comes from agencies such as that one. Someone asked a question of uh, Dr. McFarlane last night about the radiation dose hazards, right, associated with nuclear energy. Uh, in connection with our conversation here, I'll mention that those doses are, uh, the, the risks associated with those doses are calculated by reference to a dude named Reference Man. That's Reference Man, <laughs> they call him. He's a man. Um, he seems to be a white guy engaging in the kinds of activities that white guys engage in. Um, his body weight, body mass index, various physical attributes are all based on a standard white male adult population. Is this a good way to calculate radiation hazards for women and, and children? Uh, probably not, right? I'll skip over the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. I'm, I was mentioning it because it's close to home for me now, but here's another emerging energy dispute. Uh, which will play out in the context we've been discussing. And finally, we mentioned a little bit yesterday about how state, agent, state regulatory agencies have an important role on enabling and constraining uh, new forms of renewable energy production, such as rooftop solar. So um, this is my thank you slide. That is the, the picture is the, um, the, eight, the 19th century um, centrifugal a uh, governor that controls an engine speed, the faster it goes, the higher those balls rise, that cuts off the supply to the engine. It's first order cybernetics. It's a very simplistic model of how to keep a system regulated. But we all know that systems like this go wrong. The balls get stuck. The thing doesn't get oiled on schedule. Um, you use a new kind of fuel and then the power is greater and the system's not designed for it. All kinds of things go wrong. This is the free market model of regulating energy, right? You leave it to take care of itself. I think we need a more thoughtful and more sustained and more robust kind of intervention. So thanks for listening.